Good morning. Today on Spotlight, a conversation with Anika Goss, the leader of Detroit Future City. We'll get her insight into her organization's latest report. What are the opportunities for increased home ownership in the city of Detroit? And later on our Sunday morning program, Vince Paul, president and artistic director of the Music Hall, and Alex Parrish, president of the board of the Music Hall, will join me to talk about how their historic performing arts center has thrived during the pandemic. It's Sunday, April the 3rd. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Ms. Goss, thanks for joining us today on Spotlight. It's good seeing you again, uh, uh, even though it's virtual and we're usually doing it in person, but either way, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, glad to have you. Uh, you have a brand new report and your organization is used to putting out reports, but the latest one is about opportunities for increasing home ownership in Detroit and it ties into the mortgage lending area. Um, sort of mixed news, correct? Yeah, it is mixed news, um, mostly not so great news. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if we were going to start off with the positive news, it's that uh, mortgage lending is on the rise and uh, we are seeing more African Americans uh, being approved for mortgages than we've seen in a long time um, and more African American homeowners uh, in Detroit and more Detroit homeowners generally through the mortgage lending process. Uh, which is which is really good news for the economy sure. overall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, the downside. Yeah, so there are a number of downsides. Uh, the biggest downside, just to start, is uh, Detroit's numbers. The mortgage numbers in general are really low in comparison to other cities uh, that are that are the size of Detroit and based on the population, right? They should be, we're at about 2,100 2, mortgages, so 2,111 mortgages. And we should be somewhere twice that given our population. Any idea why we are so low for a city the size we are yeah. and the large African-American population we have? Yeah, well, I think there's two separate issues. One, you know, we're start we were starting so low. So in 20 in in um 2012, we were only at 200 mortgages, okay. right? So we were so low coming out of the housing uh crisis and the the economic recession. Um so getting up to 2000 is a really big jump. Now, for Detroit, for African American homeowners and borrowers, what we're seeing is African Americans are being approved for much smaller mortgages. Mm -hmm. There are also there's a huge disparity between applications and denials, um, and that is, we believe, where some of the challenges lie. Where is there are a number of Go ahead. I'm sorry, go right ahead. Well, I was just going to say that there are a number of people who are applying. Applicate, applicant numbers are very high, mm -hmm. but the disparity between white borrowers and African American borrowers, are, it's almost double. And that we, therein lies a big part of the problem. How much of this would you attribute to the lending processes mm -hmm. and is this a sign of discrimination against African Americans, or is this a direct result of the high poverty rate that we still have in the city and people not making the income to be able to meet the thresholds that you would need to meet in terms of credit yeah. and everything else? I wish it, I could say it was income, but we saw these denial disparities between African American and white borrowers across mm -hmm. income. So even upper middle class, what would be considered upper middle class uh, African American borrowers, right. were still being denied at a significantly higher rate than white borrowers here in Detroit. So it has a lot more to do. So you asked about, is it the process or is it 
discriminatory practices. What I would say is that the process is so regulated and old, right? It's based on old racist discriminatory practices mm -hmm. that even when that, that you're, I think we're finding that the system ends up overcorrecting for that old uh, system over time. So for example, in the uh, early 2000s prior to the housing crisis, when a lot of people were being approved, there were a lot of refinance programs, mortgage schemes that ended up leading to the housing crisis. Yes. They ended up, I, we, what we believe is that the fundamental lending system itself is built on practices that were discriminatory, that were built to be discriminatory. Mm -hmm. And then when they loosen those practices, they didn't throw away the whole system. They just revised the system. So the hardcore structure was still there. That is, that's our theory. <laughs> okay, uh, let me slip a little break in here. We'll come right back. We'll talk about what kind of reaction you're getting from uh, the banking and lending industry and what solutions you're offering. We'll be right back. Uh Welcome back to Spotlight, talking to the CEO of Detroit Future City, Anika Goss. Uh, all right, so you have this report out. I'm sure it's caught the attention, or at least I hope it's caught the attention of the banking industry. What are you hearing from them? Are they offering up solutions? Because this is a city, as you know, with um, a large African-American population, African-Americans in key leadership positions, um, so, and 78%. And yeah. ironically, uh, you have a cabinet member, Marsha Fudge, who is over housing and urban development in the White House. So, I'm sure this is probably getting on her radar for a city our size and saying, Holy smokes, I got a lot of work to do here to correct this across the nation. Well, we have not heard from uh, the Honorable Marsha Fudge just yet. Um, but um, what we have, we have talked to the Federal Reserve Bank and a number of financial institutions. Mm -hmm. I think because a lot of our data is coming from HMDA, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which actually uh, provides all of the utmost current data on where financial institutions are making investments, where they're making loans. Um, most of the banks knew the data that we were offering already, right? They were really much more interested in what could be done about it. Mm -hmm. How can we actually think differently about um, how we include more African-American borrowers? How do we get them to the approval process? How do we partner with nonprofit and other community development financial institutions that can transition borrow African -American, some African-American borrowers from uh, their first mortgage to a conventional uh, financial institution mortgage? I think they were really trying to be creative. From the federal side, I think we're starting, even before we released our report, we're starting to see changes, right? So Fannie Mae is really calling for changing credit practices um, so that we're looking at including rent. Sure. We can begin, if we began to include rent and on your credit application, that could improve your credit rating tremendously. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank is interested in actually doing a forum for bankers mm -hmm. to actually talk about this and really discuss and even make modifications if necessary to the regulations to try to prevent some of these regulatory practices while still con uh, protecting consumers from any kind of predatory banking, which is really the point of all of that. Uh, in the brief time we have left, talk about why this is so important in terms of wealth building and the yeah. stability that home ownership brings to 
neighborhoods and brings to an entire city. If you recall, we, Detroit Future City released last year uh, what we called the state of economic equity in Detroit. I remember. Where we uh, really focused on very specific issues uh, that are indicators of economic growth. And home ownership was one of those indicators. So this is going to be a series of unpacking where we are limited in wealth building for Detroit. And we decided to start with mortgage originations because mortgage originations actually are an indicator. They're a litmus test for capital growth and economic health in a, in, in a particular city. And so we can't really um, we can't really demonstrate growth if the majority of our population is not able to qualify for a conventional mortgage. We, it's not an indicator of growth if we only have cash sales. So we've got to get this mortgage origination piece right. Ms. Goss, have you, um, has there been enough time yet? Because I know this is a new report and the two people I'm about to mention are, are really busy with budgets and all sorts of other things right now. Has Mayor Duggan and Council President Mary Sheffield, have they reacted to this yet? Have they reached out to you to say, uh, we're gonna do all we can from our particular domains to help because this is about the overall city? Right, so we have not heard from um, Council President Pro uh, Mary Sheffield, but uh, the uh, mayor's office and um, has has copies of it, which we always we always preview sure. all of our sure. reports uh, before they're released. So they're you know they're enthusiastic. Also, I think everyone is on the same page. They want to get this right. right. They want to make sure that all of the new developments that are coming into Detroit have to include a healthy market for a diverse homeowner population sure. in Detroit. Sure, mm -hmm. and in fairness to both of them, they have both talked about it in their state of the city addresses and their yeah. state of uh, city council addresses uh, that this is certainly something that's important to them and making sure that a certain percentage of any housing in this city goes to uh, young people coming in trying to get that start, uh, the future of the city. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. I wish we had more time. We will get you back uh, and to find out just uh, what kind of success you're having on this as people start to really get in and read it and absorb it and figure out uh, the different solutions that you talked about. Thank you so much for highlighting this, Chuck. All right. It's, really it's our pleasure. It. And we'll say that people can always go to your website uh, to access this and drill down if they want to read it in detail, correct? That's right, DetroitFutureCity.com. All yep. right. Anika Goss, thank you so much and uh, best to you. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. And coming up, we'll turn our attention to the Detroit Music Hall and how it has thrived during the pandemic. Vince Paul and attorney Alex Parrish will join me. We'll be right back. start with you, Vince Paul. Uh, you're a good news story. Uh, you know, we've heard so many negative things during the pandemic, uh, but you told me the other day that uh, you guys actually thrived during the pandemic, the music hall. Uh, drill down on that. What happened? Sure. I mean, we, we, we always considered ourselves to be very nimble and really responsive to whatever the uh, conditions in the community are. And so one of the, the, the innovations that we did during the pandemic was uh, we created the Music Hall Amphitheater. And we have a parking lot directly adjacent to the Music Hall. So it was very uh, convenient for us because we could use the restrooms and the stage technicians. And so we were able to take the inside shows and move them outside into the Music Hall Amphitheater. And I might add, it augmented the beauty of our district. You know, the, the Detroit Theater District, it, it, it need I remind you, it has three stadiums and seven theaters essentially adjacent to each other. And everything was pretty quiet except for that amphitheater. And we kept those those concerts going and we did uh, ballet performances and we did garden galas. And it really turned out to be a, a, a keeper. 
So uh, I might add, we're going to bring it back this summer. Uh, Alex Paris is board chair. Uh, we have to look at the numbers. Uh, that has to make you feel awfully good. And uh, you got to give some of that attribution to the board and the guidance and the policies in working hand in glove with Vince. Yeah, Chuck, we've got a great board at Music Hall. I think there's 60 of us on the board. And it is by far the most diverse organization culturally uh, in the country. Uh, it's, you know, Music Hall is a crossroads for the community, east, west, north, south, uh, city, suburbs, black, white. And, uh, you know, for years, it's been uh, championing uh, support for all segments of the community. And it's, it's beautiful to see, uh, to see it come together through the pandemic. I think uh, we're averaging about 250,000 people in the in the in the uh, the various venues we have in, in, in music hall. Mm -hmm. uh, Attorney Paris, that really goes to the history of the music hall, as I understand it, uh, which I guess used to be called the Wilson Theater way back when, uh, when it was constructed in, in 1928 by Matilda Dodge. Um, but tell us a little bit about her vision and why you now call that the People's Theater and how that even ties into race relations. Well, Matilda Dutch might have been the wealthiest uh, woman in the United States at that time. And uh, she grew tired of going to New York for, uh, for first class entertainment and decided to build a state of the art theater in, in downtown Detroit. Spared no expense, just an extraordinary piece of art. But really, when you look back on it, uh, what really made it special was she um, deviated from convention and opened the doors to everybody. Uh, in those days, uh, Chuck, uh, black people, for example, were not welcome to sit on the main floor of a, of a theater in any major city. And uh, she threw that to the winds, opened the doors to everyone, uh, made the programming ex more access accessible to the entire population. And we carried on that tradition. Uh, Vince, I want to talk to you about um, this cultural explosion that we see going on in downtown Detroit. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We see a cultural explosion going on in the arts downtown in Midtown. Right. I think the, the, the pandemic uh, really had much more impact than you know. It's I, it's not just pent up demand. That people well, that's what I was going to ask. Out. Is it just that people yeah. were ready to get out or is it deeper than that? Oh, I think it's much deeper than that. I think uh, I think people became very reflective and contemplative during the pandemic and they wanted to spend more uh, quality time with their life. Uh, so they wanted to visit museums and go to national parks and darn it, I really want to support the performing arts. You know, I've got to make use of every single hour of my life. And so I think that that's one of the, the reasons that there's been this explosion of performances and activities and events in downtown. Again, we, we were moving 40 million people through uh, the Detroit Theater District prior to the pandemic. But I think post pandemic, we've increased on all of those numbers. Music Hall has four venues. It has the 350 Terrace on the roof that caters to maybe the 25s to 35s. Mm -hmm. It has the main hall uh, with 1700 seats where we're doing concerts and we're doing Broadway shows and we're doing dance performances. Uh, then it has the Rethas Jazz Cafe downstairs and that caters to the jazz audience. But we do a lot of other like R&B concerts down there, even puppetry and spoken word. We almost lost the music hall it came within weeks of the wrecking ball. Uh, that thankfully did not happen. Uh, but talk to me about the group that uh, has been involved for a number of years now. Uh, and I know that you've gotten some expert uh, public relations advice from uh, Leland and Tina Bassett and others. Uh, but how the corporate community has stepped up to be intimately involved with our cultural institutions. Yeah, you're right, Chuck. Uh, the music hall was a week away from the wrecking ball uh, when a group, I think, led by Bob McCabe and others, uh, David DiChiaro was also involved in that. And they raised the money to uh, to buy the music hall. Uh, didn't have enough to buy the parking lot next door, so we, we've just gotten around to uh, to getting to that uh, this okay. week, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Um, 
But, uh, you know, the uh, Detroit Renaissance, the corporate leadership in the 1970s uh, saved that institution. And then from then on, it was the, uh, the big three auto companies and a group of citizens um, who served on the board. And there are a few of them who are still with us, uh, Tina and Leela Bassett. I think are currently our longest serving uh, board members. Uh, Julius Combs, Dr. Combs, who passed away during the uh, yeah. pandemic, and Dr. Alan Combs. Ross, yep, also sure. who passed away. Th- th- those folks are still with us. And I'm proud to say, Chuck, uh, a very, very uh, incredible representation in the black community. You probably see more black philanthropic support at Music Hall than maybe any uh, cultural institution in the United States. Interesting. Vince Paul, times always are our worst enemy. I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, in just a few days, they're going to be saying play ball right down there um, around the corner from you at Comerica Park. Uh, I imagine that ties into your facility there, and that's a pretty big party. Well, it ties into the mission. What we're really trying to do is draw everyone together into a common space. We're all Detroiters after all, whether we are young and and we're partying on Tiger's opening day, or we are jazz lovers, or or maybe you wanna see a Broadway show. The bottom line is people are getting to know each other who didn't necessarily know each other before. And that really ties to the mission of the music hall, which is reflected on its board. It's reflected in its staff. We think that is what is going to take Detroit to a whole new level, is that we all have this common love of one place, Detroit, Michigan. All right, Vince Paul, Alex Parrish, thank you so much for joining me today on Spotlight. Uh, best of luck as you guys continue to navigate your way through the cultural arts in our great city and stay safe. Thank you, Joe. Right. Thanks, Chuck. And finally today, our condolences to the families and friends of Adam Shakur, the late Detroit Deputy Mayor and 36th District Court Chief Judge, and Ann Parsons, longtime Detroit Symphony President and CEO. They will indeed be missed. I'm Chuck Stokes. Have a good week.